Okay, we're on the home stretch here. Everybody still with us? Have a lemon bar or something to keep you going here. Uh, my presentation, I think it's the shortest, just about 10 minutes. Does not mean it's the least significant. We're gonna talk about uh, monitoring the investment options that you have available to you within the uh, 403B and the pension plan. So in the old days, back in the, let's say pre-early 80s, the way it was typically done is you were involved in a retirement plan, the company or the institution that sponsored the plan managed those assets and monitored those assets for you. You as the employee or as the participant didn't have any control over how that money was invested. A lot of employees liked that concept because they didn't have to make any decisions, didn't have to deal with it. The challenge there was that you know, the, the plan sponsor typically came up with an allocation that kind of fit kind of a moderate risk level so it fit real well for somebody who was in maybe the 35 to 45 year range uh, or year old range, but it really was not aggressive enough for younger employees and it was probably too aggressive for somebody who was nearing retirement. So in came participant directed retirement plans in the early 80s and that originally started off as being typically driven or directed by participants who were putting their own money into retirement plans. It's now expanded into uh, employer dollars as well as employee, employee dollars and that's kind of become the norm for most retirement plans out there. The responsibility that the company has had in the past really kind of shifts. Now they're not managing that money but they they are now responsible for making sure that that menu of options that you've got available is performing reasonably well. They've got to make sure that you have enough information to make reasonably well-informed decisions. They've got to make sure that the fees or costs associated with those funds are reasonable and competitive with the marketplace. Uh, your role obviously changes as a participant. Now you've got to make sure that your account balance reflects your objectives, your tolerance for risk. I refer to it as your stomach lining and you've got to take a more active role in this process. The one thing you don't have to do is really monitor the performance of these funds. And that's something that a lot of participants kind of lose sight of. They really get focused on, you know, am I in a good fund, am I in a bad fund? And that really should be happening within an internal investment committee uh, like we've got at SPU. So your mission as a participant is making sure that you contribute enough to meet your retirement goals and then making sure that that allocation is consistent with your objectives and your tolerance for risk, which obviously changes as time goes on. Your objectives and tolerance for risk at age 30 or 35 uh, were probably different than they are at 55, 60, 65. So that's obviously a fluid process as you get closer to retirement. Let's talk a little bit about that uh, process here. So we're going to talk a little bit about this fiduciary monitoring. We're going to talk about the initial fund selection criteria. So when we, when we add funds to this plan, whether it's because we've decided to add another investment option or because a fund is not conforming and needs to be replaced, there's specific criteria that we use to determine whether a fund should be brought into the plan. We're going to talk about the ongoing monitoring criteria uh, as well as fund replacement criteria. And then I just want to show everybody who the investment committee consists of. So there is somebody minding the store. I mean, there's a, there is a formal process. There's a specific investment policy. I obviously uh, don't expect everybody to read this, but this is in those packets, and it kind of describes the fiduciary responsibilities uh, under ERISA that the plan sponsor has. So the initial selection criteria, again, uh, if we decided to add a new type of investment fund to the plan, or we had a non-conforming fund that needed to be replaced, we would go into a Morningstar database of thousands of mutual funds and we would take the particular category, let's say it's a large cap or large company growth fund that's non-conforming, and we would screen those, there's probably about, uh, I think, 2,600 large cap growth funds, and we'd screen that database down and we'd want funds with at least a three-year minimum history, preferably five years. We want funds that are not changing their style. So if they're a large cap growth manager and value happens to be in favor, we don't want a fund that's jumping around and, and kind of following the style du jour. Uh, we're looking for a manager tenure of at least three years. We want a fund that will fall into the top third within that peer group of similar funds from a, a performance standpoint. 
And we also look at something called the Sharpe Ratio, which is a risk-adjusted return measurement. And, I, and probably the best way to describe that is we might recommend a fund with a 10% return over a 12% return if that fund with a 10% return has half the volatility as the fund with a 12% return. So volatility is brought into consideration. Um, and then expense ratio. We want to make sure that the options that you have available to you have lower expenses than the average for their particular peer group. This is kind of an interesting market that we're in right now. Is I've had to meet with several investment committees and recommend that they replace funds that only did 25 and 27 percent last year. And that's because the average peer fund might have done 32 or 33 percent. So it's a little puzzling for committees to hear me recommend or, or to have their policy dictate that funds that did in the upper 20s have to be replaced. And it's because they're falling into the bottom decile for their particular peer category. And, and we see the opposite of this happen in a down market where I'm trying to convince committees that they've got a great fund that only lost 10 percent last year. Uh, because 90% of its peer funds lost more than that. So the key issue here is we're looking at each of these options relative to peer funds, not whether or not they, they made money. Let's see. Initial selection. So ongoing monitoring criteria, not quite as stringent as the initial selection criteria. So once a fund is in the plan, every quarter we monitor the criteria or monitor the performance. We actually meet formally as an investment committee. The fund must be within the top 50th percentile uh, within its peer group on a risk-adjusted basis, again, bringing that sharp ratio into consideration uh, over three or five years. Any fund not within the top 75th percentile in the peer group over the previous one-year period will be considered for replacement. In other words, even if it looks fantastic over three and five years, if it's being outperformed by 80% 80, 80 or more than 75% of peer funds over the last year, we're going to take a closer look at that fund and see if a replacement needs to be made. Again, style drift comes into consideration, manager turnover, and expense ratio. I've had people say, well, why would you use a 33rd percentile requirement on the initial selection and then kind of slacken that up and only require them to be in the top 50th percentile after that? If we use that same 33rd percentile requirement on an, on, on an ongoing basis, about every quarter, you'd probably see 25% of your lineup attritioning off and needing to be replaced. So we're, there's kind of a balancing act between culling out the laggards, but at the same time, not having such a high attrition with these funds that we're replacing funds all the time. Once a fund does not meet the policy criteria, it goes onto a watch list. And if after two consecutive quarters, the fund has not come back into compliance, the fund will be replaced. Gary, your memory is probably better than mine, but I think we've had one fund replacement over the last few years. And typically the way that's done is the fund replacement is announced. There's a comparison between the old fund and the new fund, so you can kind of see the rationale for the replacement. No action is needed on the part of the participant. The uh, mapping takes place automatically. If you don't want to use that replacement fund, you can certainly shift your balance into one of the other funds, but that's kind of an automatic process that takes place. These are your investment committee members. Probably familiar names to most of you. And disclosure statement. And then, so I, I wanted to intentionally keep this short and sweet. The point that I wanted to get across is to make, make sure everybody understands that there is a formal process behind the scenes uh, that goes on every quarter. Uh, again, your focus is on uh, making sure that you're contributing enough and making sure that that allocation that you have is consistent with your objectives and tolerance for risk. Any questions before I hand it on? Yes. Some of us have been for <coughs> Half century, right, there was the CIA credit, and uh, then we changed the year to this mode, uh, which means we now have to watch all back. I mean, I have watched too many investments as far as I'm um, How do the two things jive? I mean, I'm obviously 
going to retire partially on an RTA craft, uh, I would say 90% probably, and the rest will be less, for me at least, sort of a new investment model. Uh, how do we get together? What do we do? Right. So, so you, you had that option several years ago, as everybody did, as to uh, whether they wanted to take their TIACREF assets and, and combine them with new contributions or leave those where they are and put all their new contributions into the, into the uh, new arrangement. It sounds like you're... Well, but, but that, was your, that was your choice. I mean, and, and a lot of people have done that, kept money in two buckets. Some people have combined. So eventually, everybody retires, and at that point, you will have some decisions to make. Do I want to take those two buckets, combine them into one uh, rollover IRA bucket, have everything in one account, and maybe even have check writing pr privileges on that account and just pay myself out of that account? Uh, every year, I'm going to get a 1099 from that IRA that says this person paid out 3000 a month for the 12-month period of time, their taxable income is $36,000. Everything else continues to earn tax deferred. You can, you could take both of those buckets and roll them into separate IRAs and start to take out of both of those at the same time or one of those. You could leave one alone and roll one into an IRA and pay yourself out of that. So there's a lot of different options. Most people tend to want to consolidate everything into one account at that point so they can kind of come up with one asset allocation, one statement, one website, one cash flow stream out of that account. But that'll be some options. You know, TIA traditional comes into play there. There's some different uh, options in terms of how you can handle that. Um, but I will say that type of guidance is available uh, through us as well as through TIA CREF in terms of what your options are and uh, what is going to be the best fit for you. Any other questions? I stayed in my 10 minutes or close to it.